Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another devlog for Dauphin. It is Saturday morning just after 10 a.m. and I'm gearing up for a hopefully productive weekend and week to follow. I have a couple ideas for the future work I'd like to try and tackle this upcoming week, but before I get into any of that, I have a less fun but hopefully very impactful task to work on. As you all know, developing Dauphin has really been challenging and developing my amateur pixel art skills, which is awesome. I've really come to love sitting down to work on pixel art in contrast to when I was just starting out and it felt like a cumbersome chore. Over the past year, I've made some really great progress with my art and also maybe have made some questionable choices concerning it. I find myself faced with one of those choices today, which was my selection of color palette when I started work on Dauphin. I've been using the Zugi 32 palette, which is a really wonderful 32 color palette that I've honestly really loved working with. The problem is, as I've started to prototype some more detailed designs for the various flora and fauna that I want to create for Dauphin, I found the selection of colors within individual color ramps to be a bit lacking. Now I say that with a full understanding that I'm still very much an amateur pixel artist, and I definitely want to acknowledge the advice that many people would give that you should maybe stick with a more restrictive palette just so that you're not overwhelmed by choice of color. And that makes sense to me, but at this kind of early stage in Dauphin's development still, this seems like the right opportunity to give a more expansive palette a try, just to see if it fits my art style a bit better. So you might have guessed it, but my first task this weekend is going to be to try and convert all of my artwork so far to a new palette, specifically the Endesga 64 palette, which I think could be a great fit with its interesting variety and contrast. This will also give me a good opportunity to both better organize my A sprite files and maybe even touch up and improve some pieces of artwork that I have not revisited in a long time. All right, gonna dive in, curious to see how this turns out. Alright, checking in now on Sunday here in the early afternoon, and before I get started working on anything today, we need to chat about colors. Yesterday I made some really great progress converting pieces of individual artwork from the Zugi 32 palette over to Endesga 64. Thankfully, before I just started randomly converting pieces, I recognized that it could be useful to convert a small set of entities that compose a single scene, so that I could do a side-by-side -side comparison to get a sneak peek of what the finished product might look like. So that's what I did. I ended up converting the interior of my research vessel, all the little decorations and even the player, to the new palette. And then I created a little side-by-side and -side GIMP of the existing version and the new version so that you could more easily see the differences. And then I posted that on Twitter and the community tab of my channel to get your feedback. This proved to be an incredibly valuable exercise. Your feedback and engagement on this has been super helpful and as I've reflected on the side-by-side -side myself, I think I've learned a lot about what I want out of my art style. We'll chat about that in a minute, but first I want to highlight the themes of your feedback. Right off the bat, without question, a larger number of you all were in support of the new color palette. Nearly everyone who commented in addition to voting in my little poll mentioned that they loved how the new colors popped and looked more saturated than my initial palette. I definitely agree with this observation. Looking at these two palettes side by side, the difference in contrast is significant, and the Zugi 32 palette by comparison almost looks washed out for lack of a better term and I definitely never thought about it that way when that was the only palette I was working with. Though the majority was in favor of the Indesga palette, a passionate minority remained in favor of Zugi, citing that the gentler, somewhat cooler colors contributed to an attractive, chill aesthetic as well as even invoking feelings of nostalgia for some. I agree with these comments as well. I think each palette almost has an entirely different mood associated with it. I know I've said it before, but this was just a super helpful exercise for me and I was blown away by how many of you all contributed with your thoughts, your comments, and your votes in the poll. So I just wanna say thank you so much for that. And as a result, I think I do know how I wanna move forward. When I set out to change my color palette, as you heard about only a few minutes ago in this video, I set out to find a palette with more colors. I thought the increased saturation in the Indesga palette could be an interesting fit, but that wasn't really my primary reason for selecting it. After viewing the comparison of the research vessel interiors and reflecting on your feedback, I really think all of this new contrast is just a little bit too much. I've realized that I share the same fondness for the Zugi palette as those who praised the chill aesthetic that it's imparted into Dauphin so far. So what does all this mean? To close out my rambling, I just do not think Indesga is quite the right fit for Dauphin. I love the bigger variety of colors that it brings, just not how bright and saturated they are, at least not in the context of the aesthetic I want to create for Dauphin. So we'll be sticking with Zugi for now, and perhaps instead of searching for a different palette altogether with more colors, I'll end up expanding this existing palette in the future to fit my needs and retain its look and feel. 
All right, I've almost certainly lingered on this topic for too long, so it's time to change gears. The good news about sticking with my current palette is that I no longer need to devote hours to the conversion of artwork. So instead, I can get back to work on building my tools and equipment system. In support of this effort in the last devlog, I created an item bar, which allows the user to quickly scroll through and use usable items in their inventory. As a result of that, my original equipment slots here in my field notes are no longer used. That's what I'm gonna start working on today, equipable gear that both appears on the player and affects their stats. This is all gonna start with the design of the player, which we're looking at here in A Sprite. This is the current version of my player, and as you might expect, if I step through the frames here, you can see the various animations that I've implemented so far. What's worth noting here is if you look down to my layers, where I only really have two important ones, my all layer, which has everything that you see of the player, and the shadow which appears below their feet. This is a problem because when I want to equip individual pieces of armor or items, those are going to cover up individual parts of the player, like the head, body, legs, or feet. Because I don't have this sprite broken up, there's really no way to do that right now. In response to this, I've gone ahead and created a separate file here for the player in which I've split up each individual important part of the player's body onto a different layer. So you can see down here in the bottom left corner, we have the head, body, legs, and feet. And that is actually going to hold true across all these different animations. So you can see if we only show the feet, we can step through all of my existing animations. And the idea is that I will have to create all these animations for each individual pair of boots or shoes or flippers that I want to implement into the game. When I export this new file as a collection of sprite sheets for each body part and bring those into Godot, what that's gonna result in is me having to actually create a different animation player and animation tree for each of those different body parts. So it's really going to quadruple the amount of animation work that I have to do here in the engine. It sounds like a pain and I'm honestly not sure if there is a different or better way to do this. So if you know of one, please let me know in the comments. But ultimately I think this approach is going to give me the flexibility I need to have individual control over these various parts of the player's body. All right, I've been doing a lot of talking this afternoon and have done zero work, so it's time to actually buckle down and start integrating some of these new sprites into the project. I'll catch up with you guys whenever that's done. Welcome back to Thursday morning. I've managed to zoom through the past two days working on my new structure for player animation, which I have to say was kind of as bad as I thought it would be. That said, despite the struggle, we made it through and all of this progress has manifested here in my player scene. Where we once had an animation player and animation tree node, we now have a new node called player body. And I did have a body node before, and that contained a bunch of positions for things like the player's hands for swinging weapons and the player's feet for leaving footprints in the sand. Now if I expand this player body node that replaced all of that, you can see we have some much more reasonable organization here. We have individual nodes for the important parts of the player, like the head, the torso, legs, and feet. And when I expand these nodes, you can see kind of what's going on inside each of these, what I'm calling player body parts. Each of these has its own animation player and animation tree. Of course, the main sprite, which is what I was breaking out in my A sprite file, and then any important positions relative to that part of the body. In our case for the torso, the back slot for holding weapons on the back and the left and right hands for holding weapons or items in those hands. The cumbersome part of this whole setup was creating an animation player and animation tree for each of these body parts. The animation tree itself was not so bad. I could just create this node and then drop in the resource that represents this state machine here, which also has all the information about the blend spaces. So when I go to add new animations to this state machine, I can just add it to that resource that's shared among all of the animation trees here. So this is actually kind of nice. The animation player node is a bit of a different story. We're looking at the animation player right now for the torso, and if I open up this animation dropdown, you can see just how many of these I've had to create for each individual body part. And the important part to note here is that these animations actually are different between the body parts. So here on the torso, we have to take into account things like the positions of the player's left and right hands and the back slot for equipping a weapon on the player's back. This is in contrast to something like the player's legs. If I open up this animation player, there's really no extra data associated with the legs right now, so it's just a sprite that we wanna change with these animations. 
Now this is where I have the opportunity to introduce new information for equipable gear. If I head up to the heads animation player, this is where I've started to do that. You can see, of course, we have the sprite for the player's head, but I've also added keyframes across all these animations for a new headwear sprite. And this will be for items like hats, snorkels, masks, anything that I want to equip on the player's head. Finally, to close the loop on all this, we need to be able to actually use these new animations. So we'll look at an example here in my player move state. In this move state and all my other player states, I used to use dependency injection to provide a reference to the animation tree, which I would then use to travel to new animation states. I got rid of that and I now have a reference to the player body and the player body provides a nice clean API to use these animations. You can see that down here where we're calling animate run and animate walk on the player body. Inside the player body class, we just have a nice collection of clean functions here to execute these animations. The body, of course, knows about all of its child parts, the head, torso, legs, and feet. So when we tell the body to animate run, we can call the corresponding function on each of these individual body parts to make sure that they all stay in sync. Lastly, here in the body part class is where we have references to our animation player and animation tree, which makes a lot more sense now because those two animation components are direct children of each individual body part. And here in the implementations for our animation functions is where we do things like set the blend position and actually use the tree to travel to the new animation state. The result of all that hard work is gameplay that looks absolutely no different than it did before, which is actually a good thing that I didn't break anything along the way during that big refactor. The exciting part is that I now have a way to equip new equipment on the player and have that displayed throughout their various animations. So next up, I think I'd like to create a hat for the player to test all this out. Ideally, I'll be able to pick it up as a loot drop, equip it from the field notes, display it on the player, and maybe even allow it to have an effect on the player's stats. I'll get a brief start on that this morning before work, and we'll catch up once I've made some progress. Quick update on Saturday afternoon, as you can see, we have the artwork created for the hat for the player. Still very much a work in progress. I think it actually looks okay from the front and from the back, but uh, the sides need a little bit of work. Anyway, that's all right. It's just here as a placeholder to help get this system working. So now it's time to make this a lootable and equipable item in the engine. All right, it is now 5 p.m. on Saturday and I've grinded out just about as much as I can on my equipable hat today. I actually ended up streaming about an hour's worth of this progress on Twitch, so a special thank you to the folks who showed up for that and gave me some great feedback. I really enjoyed that, so keep an eye out for more streams in the future. So we're back on the beach and alongside all the other stuff I have piled up for testing here, we now have a hat which you can approach. We see the familiar prompt to pick it up. And when we press E, the hat of speed will enter our inventory. This was meant to convey that equipping this hat would increase the player's movement speed, but we didn't get there today. That'll definitely be tackled in the next devlog. So at this point, we can open up our field notes, head to the buoyancy compensator vest where equipment is stored, and see our hat of speed. From this point, we can drag it up to the hat slot, which is up here on the top. I know there's nothing to really indicate which slot is for which type of item yet, but I'll get to that in the future. Once this is equipped, we can dismiss the field notes and see that our player now has a much more stylish look about him. I wasn't planning on putting sunglasses in here, but a viewer of the stream suggested it. I thought it was great and it turned out hilarious, so I kept it in for now. But as you can see, the hats will correctly follow all the player's animations because I designed it around those player animations in a sprite. So really what I'm doing is just dropping the sprite sheet for the hat right on top of the existing sprites and everything works out really well. All the attacks, running forwards and backwards and everything, and uh, just a, a pretty good aesthetic here, I love it. On the technical side, this was pretty easy to hook up to the player as well. Here in my player class, we're already connected to a signal from the equipment display that is signaled when a piece of equipment changes. So here we capture which slot changed and we respond by handing the responsibility off to the player body, just as we did with the animations. So we tell the player body that it needs to equip a new item or an equipment item at a certain index. And here in player body, we just have two new functions that do very much the same thing as our animation functions. They just take care of managing the individual body parts and either equipping or removing an item. 
the end result of all this is pretty great. We can pick up items and equip them to the player. We can see them visually and in the future have them apply changes to the player's stats. And we can go back into our inventory and unequip them and return back to normal. I would love to finish off the speed modifier on that hat today, but I am pretty tired at this point and I'd love to get this video out tomorrow, so I'm going to call it there. As always, I want to give a big shout out to my Garami supporters on Patreon for their continued support. Cody Odin, Finnick Foo Games, Mega Ombre, Vlad Sunny, James Kennedy, Jess Sargo, and those who wish to remain anonymous. On another community related note, I'm pleased to announce that a Discord server is finally on the horizon. I'm putting the finishing touches on now and will post a link as soon as it's ready. Looking forward to seeing y'all there. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.